So now let me introduce our presenter who just arrived from Cleveland. Um, Dr. John Vickers is an assistant professor of history at Case Western Reserve University and a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. Dr. Vickers specializes in early American and Native American history. His research focuses on indigenous constructions of citizenship and race, and theories of native political sovereignty and governance. His first book project, The Miami Nation, A Middle Path for Indigenous Nationhood, is an exploration of the political history of the Miami tribe through the 19th and 20th century. And best of all, Dr. Vickers received his PhD from the Ohio State University. <laughs> Just another reason we already like him. Please welcome Dr. Vickers. I I a cheke to pay when they lack a coke or a hanumi ka kikwed. A mawia wins wa ane, ni la miami a mitosenia. Melona te ha ane ishi mitosene wa yangwe. I introduce myself in Miami a tawenge, the Miami language. Before I tell you what that means, I also do want to apologize for being a little late. Um, as I was telling them, I have a five-year-old and a 14-month-old at home, and they have their own schedules, and we're not thrilled that I had not consulted them properly about what, what I was doing today. Um, but in my language, I just said, hi, it's nice to see you guys. It's good to be here. Um, my name is John Pickers, and yeah, as she said, I'm an assistant professor of history at Case Western um, and a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, a tribe on whose homelands Columbus stands, but for reasons that we'll get into today, our tribe is now headquartered in, in Oklahoma. So I was thinking about how to do this presentation, what I wanted to do, and talking about indigenous Ohio. And I was trying to figure out how do I want to talk about this? And I came up with kind of a question that I decided I didn't want to answer. And so I'm gonna make you guys answer this. We'll have a little audience participation in here. So I hope you're all right with that. What's Ohio? Good answer. It, it, so the word Ohio comes from the Seneca language, the Iroquoian language, meaning beautiful river, 100%. What else? 100%. It's, it's part of the original Northwest Territory. So it's got, there's, it's got a history there. All right, I'll, I'll make it easy for you. I'll narrow it down here. When does Ohio start? 1803. 1803. Excellent. These are like my student, students, you're giving very similar answers. Uh, I like that. It helps when you give the answers I think you're going to give, so I know kind of where to go from there. Um, but we think of it as, yeah, as 1803. That we, it's the state. It's part of the Northwest Territory. It's now part of the United States. It has these really specific geographic boundaries. It's temporally um, about 200 years old. That's how we think about it. And so when we talk about Indigenous Ohio, I like to remove us from that perspective, because while it's True, in a lot of ways, it's also limiting and blurs a lot of Ohio's past. So human beings have been in what's now Ohio since about 13,000 BC. And I bring up that point to really recenter us and make us think about how old Ohio is. This place is ancient, not just animal life or plant life or microorganisms. Human beings were standing where we were standing 13,000 BC, so 15,000 years ago. That's indigenous Ohio. Um, and to put that in perspective, that seems like a big number, and it's hard to, at least for me, spatialize what that means. The Great Pyramid of Giza, right? This, this miracle of the ancient world. That was built about 2,000 BC. So about 11,000 11, years before that ancient pyramid was built, people are standing where we're standing. We're living their lives where we're living our lives. We often think of the U.S. And, and Ohio as this newer thing of a 19th century or maybe 18th century construction, but it's not. It's really a lot older. And so I want to start with that kind of really ancient past to center what then happens as we get into the more what we call the modern era. The other thing about Ohio that I want to emphasize throughout this talk is throughout its, its history that we know, and there's a lot we don't know in the pre-contact era, um, but from what we know, Ohio has been a shared space. It's a place where different communities have always lived together and didn't always get along. So we often think of Native Americans, Indians, 
as kind of this homogenous group. And so I also want to start out here by really breaking down that they're not. So there's a lot of really dis important distinctions, um, and not everyone gets along. And Ohio's a really good place of centering that. Um, I like some things about this map. I hate other things about this map, and we'll get into it in a second. Um, but there's actually three distinct language groups that occupy Ohio at the time of contact. Uh, so again, like looking at 1500s, six, early 1600s. Um, and when I say different language group, I don't mean you know, Germany versus Spain or France. We're talking about cultural groups that are as distinct as um, England from China, from France from South Africa, um, Saudi Arabia from Australia. I mean, just languages are not related, cultures are wildly distinct, um, all sharing what we now call Ohio. And the three major ones that are here at the point of contact are the Iroquoian language family, um, and they're really, really fascinating, because, and they're really unique in a lot of ways. They're matrilineal, so kinship last name all descends from the mother. They're what, I, what I'm calling quasi-matriarchal. Uh, I put the quasi in there because it's a debate whether or not they're a full matriarchy or not. Um, but but the, what they call the clan mothers, the elder women, make most of the political decisions. They appoint male chiefs but they can also remove the chiefs. So they have a huge amount of power. Women have a huge amount of power in these societies. Um, and there are some scholars who, I, who will argue they were entirely matriarchal, and I think there's an argument for that. Um, and they're organized into these broad confederacies. So we'll hear about the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, is, is people familiar with that group? In mostly what's now in New York, a little bit of Pennsylvania. Um, they're probably the most well-known. Uh, the Wyandotte Confederacy, which arises in Ontario, but quickly moves into Ohio in the 1600s, 1700s. Um, and the Erie Confederacy, and you actually do see them on this map, up in northeast Ohio. So they're also these larger political units. Um, not quite the same as the modern nation state, but they're these larger uh, political structures, which make them quite powerful. Then you have Algonquian-speaking peoples. Um, and those are tribes we're really familiar with a lot in Ohio. So think of Shawnee, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, um, the, the Lenape or Delaware who end up in Ohio or Algonquian. And again, you see them on the map here, the, the Kickapoo, which they put in southern Michigan for reasons I'm not positive, um, are Algonquian. Uh, and these are patrilineal groups, so uh, status descends from the father. Um, but they're gender equitable groups. So there's not patriarchal or matriarchal. Each gender has distinct roles in the community, um, but there's not a power difference between them. Um, genders are actually kept quite separate in that way. Women have their work, men have their work, and really the two don't come together a lot. Um, but there's not one is not valued over, over the other. Um, and unlike the Iroquoian, they're organized into autonomous villages. So when we talk about a tribe kind of in, this, in this historical sense, we're talking about a, a linguistic and a cultural group. Politically speaking, they're divided amongst individual villages. Each is able to, which is able to make its own decisions, operate on its own, negotiate with different groups on its own, which will end up having some problems when Europeans show up, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, and the last group I want to talk about that we're not going to talk a lot about, um, but I think it always surprises people when I mention it, are the Siouan peoples. How many people knew there were Siouan peoples in Ohio? Because what we think of Siouan peoples, what do we think of? Exactly. Literally, the Dakota and the Lakota of North and South Dakota. But there's actually Siouan-speaking peoples living in the Ohio Valley. They're originally in the Ohio Valley. There's some that end up in the Carolinas. It's actually a much broader uh, organization. Um, and at, until about 1600, there's several Siouan-speaking communities in southern Ohio, northern Kentucky, right along the river there. Um, and they share some similarities with their neighbors, but are also really different in some ways. And the other three, again, we'll talk about, they're patrilineal. Um, again, they're also gender equitable. Um, but the difference here is they have, they're organized around clan-based villages. Um, so for, other, for a lot of other communities, clans are, are tools that kind of organize these disparate villages. So they make their own decisions, but clans are part of the, the linguistic tie that unites them. For these Siouan-speaking peoples, these clans, um, or we're often called clans, sometimes bands, sometimes voides, there's a bunch of anthropological terms, um, actually in defining the village and defining community. Um, and so uh, as they're, they're leaving the Ohio Valley, these clans end up separating, becoming their own tribes. And so today we talk about the Osage, the Kansas, the Quapaw, the Ponca, and the Omaha. Again, all tribes were kind of associated with lower plains. These are all Siouan peoples from Ohio. Um, 
And so again, just really want to emphasize there's a lot of difference happening here. And sometimes these groups get along and sometimes they don't. Uh, and sometimes groups within each language family get along and sometimes they don't. You know how families are. Um, but yeah, so I really wanted to kind of emphasize that moving forward because that will be important. Um, the other thing, I just kind of wanted to show you guys, get a sense of, of some of these differences. This is from a really, really cool book that was created, uh, written uh, late 1600s, called the Codex Canadensis. I think I'm saying that right. They took the word Canada and tried to make it Latin, um, which I'm not sure how you do that. But so Canadensis, and there are these drawings and, and early reports of early French contact with native peoples. Um, and you can actually see how they're depicting them differently and how that tells us, at least how the French are thinking about these people. So the image on the left uh, is someone, is an Ottawa man. And you can kind of see they have some of his clothing on his arms. Those are either bands or they might be tattoos. He has that giant sun tattoo on his chest. Uh, Native peoples of the time are very heavily tattooed. Um, he, has, he, he has a very long pipe that what looks like a giant thing he's holding is a pipe. Um, pipes generally symbolize peace and communities coming together. Um, and you see he's holding a bag here, likely symbolizing uh, the Ottawa's trading relationships with the French. Again, they, had, they had, tended to have a really good relationship, um, really good economic relationship. And so he's viewed here as, as someone holding a, a, a pipe for peace and a bag for trade. And on the other hand, is an, uh, is an Iroquois person from the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, this is an Onondaga, although they identify him as an Onondaga in Virginia which I find really interesting. And I don't know if they mean what we think of as Virginia today, or if they're talking about Virginia as a code word for British colonies writ large. Do that also will sometimes happen. Also, at one point, Virginia claims to own everything to the Pacific Ocean. So there's, could be that too. That, that's a whole other conversation, um, but that gets wacky. Um, but again, you can see some similarities, but some differences with how the Ottoman man's dressed. Where the Ottoman man has kind of a breech cloth right here. The Iroquois man has full leggings. Um, the Iroquois man has a hatchet. He's got a big old axe. What does that tell us? Things of the Iroquois aren't always friendly with the French, but he's also holding a pipe. Some Iroquois they like, some Iroquois they don't. Some Iroquois like the French, some Iroquois don't like the French. Um, and as you study, there's, I mean, dozens of these images in the book. And so as you study them, you get a real sense of these individual tribal aesthetics, but then also how the Europeans are viewing them. Um, but speaking of not getting along, uh, the first major event we can really talk about um, as historians, as people who study written text and language, is a time where people aren't getting along. Um, and that kind of defines the beginning of Ohio in the, in the kind of modern post-contact period. Um, and it's what's called you know, the Morning Wars or the Beaver Wars for, for two real reasons. And it's, its biggest claim is it's the first real large-scale war in definitely in the Great Lakes, arguably in North America. Uh, most uh, indigenous war, uh, wars historically were fairly small scale. Because again, you're dealing with fairly smaller communities, individual villages. So if you go out and, and most, most you know, militias of men were maybe 20, 30 people, um, 20, 30 men. So if you go out there and you lose 20 people, that's now 20 people who cannot hunt for you anymore, cannot uh, create families anymore. It's devastating to the community. So most wars historically, you're only losing four or five people in kind of smaller skirmishes because economically you can't handle that. If you lose half your men in a battle, your village is just gone. You can't feed your family. Um, what makes this different is there's two massive changes to the Great Lakes, and Ohio's hit really badly in this. Uh, one, something we're all familiar with, European disease. It's kind of a cliche at, that po at this point, but it's also true. Native peoples don't have a lot of the same immunities to diseases that Europeans have. There are diseases that have developed in Europe that just never developed uh, in North America. And there are some really interesting historical reasons why that happens, but that's a different conversation. And so when Europeans arrive, even arriving in New England or Florida or Mexico or Brazil, these diseases spread like wildfire across the continent. Um, and they're absolutely devastating. Uh, in, some, in some populations, killing off 90% of the population. It absolutely is devastating. Um, but there's hope. Uh, again, native communities have dealt with disease before, they've dealt with death before, and they've created ways of mitigating population decline. And that mechanism, which is shared for most tribes, at least in the Great Lakes area, um, involved uh, capturing people, usually children, um, but capturing people from an enemy community and incorporating them into your village. Um, so if you're at war with somebody, if you raid their village, you can take prisoners back and you can 
The belief is you can make them into your own people, you can assimilate them into your own community. Um, so people who were born Iroquois could become Ottawa, and you would be adopted into a, a, an Ottawa family, learn to speak that language, be, um, being placed into a clan in that community. Um, and so there's a belief that if you have, have some small population to go on, you can replace that with, with new people that you would capture through war. The problem is what happens when you lose 90% of your population? That's a lot of people. And, and because these are not just cultural beliefs, but there's a spiritual component too, there's, there's a necessity that you have to do this, both for your political survival, but also for the spiritual survival of your community. Okay, but we're still like, you can't capture that many people. It still gets, that's still challenging. But I said there's a second thing that comes in. Not just disease, but coming in roughly in New England and New York, um, a small little nation, I don't talk about them a lot, called the Dutch shows up. And the Dutch bring guns. And the Dutch want really only one thing when in, in, in New York. They want beaver furs. So we don't think about a lot of this about this today, but beaver is incredibly valuable in Europe. I, I don't actually don't know if, I'm if there's just no beaver in Europe or if it's just very few. But when they get to North America, they discover beavers exist. Europeans go nuts. French, British, Spanish, everyone goes nuts for beaver fur. That becomes the height of fashion in Europe. Kings are wearing beaver gloves, beaver fur hats. Um, it, is, it is incredibly valuable. And a colonial empire can get rich off beaver fur alone. And so the Dutch come to New York and they're willing to give the Iroquois a lot of guns if they'll give them beaver furs, because they can make way more money out of the beaver furs than they came with the guns. And frankly, you know, we think of guns as this really advanced technology. 1600s muskets, they're fine. They're more, they're, they're more better as a scare tactic, you know, shooting someone having a giant explosion, as opposed to actually hitting someone. They're very inaccurate. Uh, so the Dutch are willing to lose some guns. But if you're from a community or a, a continent that's never heard a gunshot before, and you're going to war with someone with a gun, that's terrifying. As someone who also doesn't really, wasn't grown up around guns, if I hear a gunshot, it's scary. But I know what a gunshot sounds like. If you've never heard a gunshot before and someone's running at you shooting a gun at you, I cannot even imagine. And so the Iroquois go on, I still tell you the war is two names. This, these war, this war is to replenish their people um, because of all the, the, the deaths, hence the mourning part. They're, they're, it's a war of mourning to replenish the population, but also beginning to start going to these areas, other tribes hunting grounds to take the beavers so they can trade them back to the Dutch and eventually the English to get not just guns, but then metal pots, um, certain kind, new kinds of cloth, um, all kinds of tools. Um, I have a, a friend who does a lot of like historical uh, kind of reenactments and historical cooking, and he's he done some cooking with like clay pots and, and you know. And I remember talking about some of these early trades, and he said, cooking with a clay pot is so incredibly frustrating because after a couple uses, it breaks. I think I spent all the time making a new one, and it's a whole effort. It's like, I cannot imagine how exciting a metal pot was when that first comes in, because that changes everything. You get so much more free time in your day to do other things, do other chores, uh, other, other tasks, play with your kids. Um, and, and so it's not just guns, it's all kinds of mental technology is absolutely changing, changing their worlds. But one of the first places they hit, and it's bad, it does, I think, a fairly good job of showing it, um, is they start hitting um, Southern Canada and Northern Ohio. So uh, the, you see the Erie Confederacy, who's an Iroquois speaking group, by the 1650s is eliminated. They are destroyed, scattered. Um, their descendants are still alive, but they're now Iroquois. Um, and so, but through these wars, Ohio just completely opens up. Tribes, Miami, Shawnee, Iroquoian, uh, Sioux, and everyone gets out of Ohio becomes, because it becomes this massive nexus of war and destruction. And that's when they actually meet Europeans. And so it's interesting, when you, when you read these early European accounts of, of native peoples, um, they're not very flattering, but you have, it, it's often like, oh, they're out poor and dirty, and you know, they're savages and all these things. And it's like, well, no, these are people, these are refugee camps. These are people who are fleeing for their lives. They're not taking their, their nicest clothes with them on, on their journey you know, they're, while they're fleeing their burning village. Um, and so it's, you have to really read against a lot of these early European accounts. Um, but that's how they meet these people. And they start to build relationships, and particularly the French. So the French have started coming into what's now Canada and to the Great Lakes um, in, the, in the 1600s, 
right as native Ohioans are fleeing into Michigan, Wisconsin, Canada, and so they're coming into contact with the French. Um, and the French end up being really good allies with a lot of native tribes in, in Ohio. And I want to talk about three specific aspects of that relationship and then contrast them with what happens with the English and eventually what happens with the Americans. Um, one, kind of standard, missionaries. The French are sending large numbers of Jesuits into, into France. The Jesuits at this time have, they're not the only missionary order, but pretty much the rubber stamp of the French king to come in and convert native peoples to Catholicism. Um, and so you have these Jesuits coming out, and they're often going by themselves. So you'll have, of course, I mean, of a single Jesuit going into, into Indian country and dealing with Native peoples, interacting with Native peoples, and that's all he'll talk to for three years. And so they're coming in, they're learning Native languages, they're learning Native cultures. They document a huge amount about Native societies, um, but they're there to convert. The other group coming in are traders. Again, makes sense. If you need to get this beaver fur, you send in the trader. And so you get these traders are starting to come into these areas. But like the Jesuits, although for a very different reason, they're also generally single men coming into these communities. They're not bringing wives and children. And, and it's not like when we think of like New England settlement or Virginia settlement where it's these families coming in and setting up communities. It's very, very different. It's a bunch of single men, celibate Jesuits and just single Frenchmen. Um, and so they end up actually marrying heavily into native communities. Um, and even today, native groups from Ohio and the Great Lakes, it's very, very common to native people to have a French last name in their family. And how's that? Well, there's this large amount of, of intermarriage from these, these uh, French traders who also learn very quickly that if you marry into the community, they're going to be nicer to you. If, if, if you're trading with your brother-in-law, he's probably going to give you a better deal than if you're trading with a stranger who may or may not trust you. Marriage also brings in uh, community. And thinking long term, right now you're trading with your brother-in-law. What happens when you're, if you're, let's say you marry into the Iroquois Confederacy where uh, they're matrilineal. What happens when your son gets chosen as chief? Well, then you've got a really good economic connection to this community. You, you're, you know, and so they found it's really economically advantageous. And so that also helps some peaceable relationships. If you're, you're, they see the, the French as trustworthy to that extent because they're, they're marrying and they're incorporating together. Um, and then politically, and this is, this is really, really important. France doesn't, as of a few places, own any land in North America. And, and they know this. What they have with these, and there are a few exceptions, like Quebec being an exception, Louisiana being an exception. Like there's these really specific, and by Quebec, I mean the town, not the province. These really specific places, but for the most part, they don't actually own any land in North America. They have trading rights, vertical trading rights. Basically, through the missionaries, through the, these traders, they've negotiated rights to build force tra to trade with native populations, to get beaver fur. Um, and outside of a really few select places, Detroit will end up being one of these like, where they actually have some settlements. But outside of these really few places, they don't actually own any land. And so when there are French people in Ohio, and there are until the 1800s, they don't own any of it. They're just living there with permission of the tribes. And when the tribes want them to leave, they leave, but willingly or otherwise. Um, but they don't actually own the land. And this becomes really, really uh, crucial when the, when the English and the Americans come in. Um, so one, their major goal is, is trading rights to the beaver. And two, more than anything else, to buffer the English. As the English are coming kind of westward into Pennsylvania, into, from Virginia into what's now Kentucky, into western New York, the French do not want the English expanding further. They're their major trading rival, economic rival. At some point, there's also just some pettiness. The French and the English just do not like each other, and they like messing with each other. It's, I know, it's interesting being a historian, like, we talk about these really important events and the world-changing events, and they're really haughty and huge, and we need to treat them with reverence. But then there are also these moments where you read some of these documents coming from the French king or the British king or, or prime minister, and you're like, come on. You're an adult. This is, this is, this is childish. You're just doing this because you know it'll make them mad. You don't even gain anything from this. So, so they're also the wanting to expand their trading empire just to stop the English, just so the English can't do it. Um, but otherwise, a relatively positive relationship. Like they're they're making efforts as far as the colonial power goes. They're they're better than most. No, not better. They're less harmful than most. I would say if you're a colonial empire, they're not you're not good at it. So I don't know, maybe better is the wrong term there. If your goal is to be a colonizer, they're not good at it. But less harmful. So now we're going to jump to the other part of Ohio and talk about these early relationships with the English, and you're going to see some similarities again. Missionaries. Um, conversion is a huge part of, of the colonization, and which sect will usually depend on, on which country we're talking about. Um, with the English, actually, it's not Anglianism, it's not um, Presbyterianism, 
It's not some of these mainline Protestant religions we think of with England. It's, at least in Ohio, primarily Moravian. Has anyone heard of the Moravians before? Actually, a few, I, I, I appreciate that. I don't usually get that, actually, that many people. Um, but they're fascinating because they're not English. They're Germans. Um, and they're coming out into what's now what we call like the back country, which is like what's now Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio. Uh, and they're coming in um, sometimes as, as communities and, and as individual missionaries uh, to convert native populations to Christianity. Um, one of the reasons, and one of the reasons they're coming out, they're the ones coming out, and it's not, again, these mainline you know, like British religions, um, is there's a lot of anti-German sentiment by the 1700s and going into the 1800s. They're the largest white, non-English speaking population at that point, because um, they're, they're starting to immigrate in large numbers. Um, during the revolution, the British hire German mercenaries to fight the colonists. So like, there's, there's some xenophobia happening, there's some anti-German sentiment happening. And so, frankly, for a lot of them, it's safer to move out into um, kind of these, these more native controlled spaces because um, there's a little more safety there, ironically. Um, but they're also then trying to convert. Um, and the thing that makes the Moravians really unique is that they're pacifists. They are fully, again, we got to think like the Quakers, like a fully non-violent peoples, which also makes them trustworthy native peoples and good to convert native peoples. Because um, if you're and this is all in the story. It's hard to talk about the gospel and love thy, love thy enemies yourself and all these things while you're also actively at war with someone. That's, and and many people will point out that, that kind of that, that joint position of like I, who, I remember who the quote is like I, uh, I like your Jesus. I don't like your Christians. There's a little bit of that here, um, but the Moravians don't have that problem. They're nonviolent. They are not a threat to native peoples. They don't want to be a threat. They want to convert. And so you know. They, there's, there's a simulation thing, but they're not violent, and they convert native peoples into pacifism, which also becomes a thing. Um, and an issue down the line. Um, again, traders, beaver fur. Everyone was beaver. Going into the revolutionary era, everyone was beaver fur. What makes them actually distinct, though, from uh, most French traders uh, in, in two parts is one, they don't really intermarry. Um, oftentimes, they do have families back home on the East Coast. And even those who are single, they generally don't intermarry. It's much more of an economic, purely economic relationship. Um, there's not that same level of incorporating themselves into native communities. There's a lot more moving back and forth. You, know, you go out to Ohio and trade for a little bit, then you go back to your home in Pennsylvania. Um, so it's, 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 it's a really strictly economic relationship, which isn't necessarily bad. You can build those relationships, but it, it looks different from the French. And so for a while, the French are actually doing better than the English because native peoples are preferring this more kinship-based economic system. The other real big difference is these English traders generally work for the British crown or work as part for British military officials. They're, they're an agent of empire. So they're also the ones who are going to be translated during tre early treaty negotiations. Um, so they're working more as go-betweens between the British empire and native peoples, um, as opposed to the, to the French traders who, frankly, the cr French crown doesn't like all the time. In fact, one, there's, there's some really interesting letters with the writing text, the Jesuit missionaries in, in France being like, can you stop all this intermarriage with the native peoples? It's like, we don't like interracial marriage, we don't want to do it, you stop these traders from, from doing all this. And the British were like, we'd love to, we can't. The native people love this, it's, the trade's booming, like we can't actually stop this. Um, so they're, they're very, very different in terms of their goals. Uh, and the other difference is, the other new thing, where France had trading rights and was focused on trading rights, the English are coming in as land speculators. From the get-go, they want native land. Um, and in fact, by the mid-1700s, group, groups like the Lenape Delaware, who, can anyone guess where the Delaware are originally from? Delaware, New Jersey, um, are moving into, uh, into what's now Ohio and setting villages up in Ohio. Um, and that quite close to where we are in Columbus, um, there were several Delaware communities. Uh, Lenape communities, uh, because they're getting pushed out by uh, the Pennsylvanians, by the New Jerseyans, who are trying to claim Lenape land as their own. Uh, they also, I think because they're also making this westward migration, end up pretty heavily converting to Moravians. They're one of the most successful Moravian uh, conversion groups. Uh, probably, I think, because they're, they're being pushed out by the same groups of people, which bond you together, um, and they're kind of moving up into the same places. And so you have these really two different systems that's happening. Um, they're all kind of converging into Ohio. So again, you think of like the British in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Virginia, and then the French, Canada, Michigan, 
they're all Missouri, they're all starting to coalesce into Virginia or into Ohio. And so Ohio becomes the target um, for decades. And so I'm not a military historian. There are colleagues of mine who would go into the nitty gritty of each of these battles for you. I'm much more interested in the social and cultural and political context of them. So I'm putting them on there so you know what they are. There are great books if you want to get into like the military details. Um, absolutely recommend it. Not my thing. Um, but the biggest, the most well known is the French and Indian War, which is always an interesting for me, a case, interesting case study of, you know, the Victor writes um, writes the history books. Who do you think named it the French and Indian War? Wasn't the French or the Indians, um, but it was it was English. Um, but it's this massive war fought over Ohio. We don't again. We don't. I'm talking. We don't. It's this war of empires and this global. Like, no, it's fought over Ohio. They want Columbus. They want Upper Arlington. They're gonna and they fight a global war to get Upper Arlington. Um, and uh, there are two primary causes. Uh, one, you have the British British traders again, empires of empire actually traveling down all the way to what's now Piqua, Ohio. There's a Miami village there called um, Pinguilena Onge. It gets anglicized to Piquilene. It gets shortened to Piqua. Uh, but British traders are coming down all the way to Piqua, which is getting really close to the French area. The French are not happy about that. So they, um, and so the, 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 that village ends up getting, there's a battle of that village uh, where an Ottawa militia ends up destroying the village um, because they don't want the British coming into this area. Because they people also who are allied to the French see the British as kind of a threat. Uh, and then back on the other side, you have um, the British, and we'll get into which ones, um, where we have the French start coming down and building a fort um, in what's now Western Pennsylvania, but again, state lines don't exist. So they get, it's part of Ohio, essentially, at that point, called Fort Duquesne. So now they're getting real close to the British territory. It's kind of like the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know? Uh, U.S. is putting missiles in Turkey, Russia doesn't like that, so they're putting missiles in Cuba. To, yeah. um, but so France is going into Fort Duquesne, British are going to pick one, no one's happy. And so the British, particularly the Virginians, send a militia under a young up-and-comer, kind of a nobody, but he seems like he's got potential, uh, a colonel named George Washington to rout out the French. Tell them, they march up and you got, tell them to leave, you gotta go. And he goes up there, he, you know, not, he doesn't knock on the door, but says, with proclamation of the British king, you cannot live here, Britain owns this land. So what, the, what do the French do? Yeah, they said, no, that's, that, that's cute. No, we're not, we have, we have this is a we camp's fort, we're not, we're not going anywhere. Um, British don't like that. Um, and so they're, they end up attacking the fort under uh, Mr. Washington. Um, Take the, they take the fort, they win, but, and they're debating hands on who actually does this, and that's a whole other conversation. The British officer, that, or the French officer that surrenders to Washington, gets executed. And the Geneva Convention hasn't happened yet, but there's one kind of big no-no in war. You don't execute a prisoner of war, especially not an officer, a high rank. This guy's part of the nobility. And so it creates this massive, massive war, this global war, there's even a European component, all about taking Ohio. Um, I teach a class on indigenous Ohio, and I love talking to students from Ohio in the class because we don't talk about how important Ohio actually is in, in global history and native history, and it always blows their mind. Like, no, all these big figures, you know, all they care about is Ohio. This is what they want, and they will kill as many people as they have to to get it. Um, but the French Indian War happens, and Britain wins. They get to name the war. It's a, it's, 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 it's a big day for them. And so France cedes their trading rights to Britain in the Treaty of Paris. 1763, um, and they, they, they agreed to pull out their, their military personnel. The French people that are all living there stay there. So all, if, you know, people living in Detroit or Louisiana or, or some of these French traders, you wake up one day and your country just left. Your governor just left. It went back to France. You're just now here and apparently you're now living in England, which is, I cannot imagine the shock that that, that conversation is. Um, but they pull, out, they pull out their trading rights. And so they say, Britain, you can occupy these trading forts we've built. Those are yours now. You can, like, we're, we're, the government itself is out. Britain doesn't fully hear that line. They don't hear we're pulling out of the trading rights. They hear all of North America is now yours. All the land is now yours. And they think, great, we now own everything. We've won. We've won the game of empire. 
We have all of North America. And, you know, the Spanish have a little bit, but we'll deal with that later. We have the Great Lakes. We have Ohio. We have Upper Arlington. We're good. Um, they then tell native people that. And it doesn't go particularly well. Uh, they, 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 they begin to occupy some of these French forts. Uh, again, occupy it takes a little while because they're, they're slowly moving people in. And they, literally, the, the new governor of Canada, um, uh, uh, General uh, Amherst, who, namer of Amherst College, um, literally has a proclamation to native peoples we own all of this land. We will no longer be, um, we will no longer be giving you gifts as part of our economic rights. Um, you will hand us over the beaver. Have a nice day. Um, there's, there's even, he even has a discussion, um, I can't remember with who now, another British officer of like, um, can, can we send out smallpox blankets to kind of quell the populations a bit, keep them, I mean, literally, so when we, that, when we think of that, you know, smallpox blankets, this is where it comes from. It's from this story of this general Amber. He gets removed very quickly from this position. Um, but Naples don't respond well to that. And so there's this massive conflict in the Great Lakes in Ohio called Pontiac's War. I don't like the name of it just because I don't like centering Pontiac. He's one Ottawa war leader. He's the one who attacks Detroit. He's a major, major native. But there's a lot of other people doing a lot of other things. And it's this massive native uprising against British control. They burn most of the British forts in Ohio, New York, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan. Most of the British forts either get, all of them get attacked, most of them get burned. Um, the big one, Fort Detroit, uh, was able to withstand the attack, which is why the war is usually considered a failure. Um, I don't, because after the war, the British no longer make that claim. They no longer say, we own this land, this is all ours now. They, they, they go back to the language of trading rights. Um, and Native people in this negotiation say, like, you can come back to this field we destroyed, and you can trade with us. And you can live in your fort, and you can stay in your fort, and you will not leave the fort. Most British people do not go back to the fort. They don't, it's not even worth it. Um, but this happens across Ohio and the Great Lakes, and the British do not want to deal with this, because the French Indian War is massively expensive. It, it bankrupts the British Empire, which is part of why Amherst is kind of getting a little dictator with, with tribes about, about economic, their economic trade deals. Um, but then, then it led to another kind of expensive war where all their, their reports got destroyed. Countless amounts of goods got burned. They don't want to deal with that again. So they say, fine, trading rights. And in fact, we're not going to make this ever happen again. So in 1763, they pass the proclamation of 1763. It's not cleverly named. Uh, it says everything west of the Appalachian Mountains is, you can see it on the map itself, lands reserved for the Indians. Uh, you're also starting to see the uh, reserve, that's where you're starting to see the language of like reservation, to all come up with this. Um, and so basically leaving Ohio in the hands of native peoples. Well, the Virginians don't particularly like that. You have people like George Washington, um, uh, Peter Jefferson, the father Thomas Jefferson, um, other wealthy, well, wealthy Virginians saying, no, we just started a war because we didn't want the French to have Ohio. Now you're telling us we don't, we don't get it either? That's not fair. We, we thought the deal was we get Ohio. We want Ohio. Um, Washington had already mapped out uh, lands on the Ohio River that he planned on uh, speculating and selling to settlers. Um, again, there, was, there were plans in motion. And the British were like, no, we're not, we're not paying for this. This is, this is not going to go well. This is going to start another massive war. Uh, we wanted, especially we wanted Ohio, we're not going to put all our effort into Ohio now. We have it enough. We can trade with the native peoples. We're getting the beaver. We're making money off that. Let's just chill. And so of course, and everyone's fine with that. And it all works out. Um, no, so the Americans are, are pissed. And so that's, again, 1763. What happens in a decade? There's a war. There's a pretty big war that happens. There's a couple big wars that happen. Um, First off, actually the first one we're going to talk about a lot, Lord Dunmore's War. That's just Virginia, and Lord Dunmore is the, the, the royal governor of Virginia, and that's just him, Virginia saying, yeah, we're ignoring this proclamation, we're not going to, we want Ohio, we're, we're taking Ohio. This was the game plan for decades, we're taking Ohio. Um, and so he violates the, the proclamation line, expands into what's now Kentucky, a little bit southern Ohio, and it's this massive war with the Iroquois and the Shawnee, who, are, who live in that area, use it for hunting grounds. Again, it's kind of a disaster. It, people debate on who wins, but, um, but again, another expensive war. So you're the king in London, you're the prime minister, like, okay, 
We keep getting expensive wars for Ohio. We need to figure out how we're going to pay for this thing. Like, Beaverfur is not getting it anymore. We're bankrupt. We need to figure out how we're going to raise some funds because these colonists keep starting wars for Ohio. How are we going to get monies out of the colonists? Taxes. I have a few in there. Yeah, taxes. We're going to tax the colonists to make them pay for the war they started. Because again, remember Washington invading Fort Duquesne um, or Lord Dunmore. Uh, we're going to make the colonists pay for these wars they're starting so we can get ourselves out of bankruptcy. Now, it doesn't go well. The colonists are pissed. And so you have the American Revolution. And they talk about the proclamation line is one of those causes. We don't talk about a lot in US history, but that's one of those causes. Um, and there are several in the Declaration of Independence. They accuse the king of sending merciless savages against us, whose method of warfare is you know, was it here too un or method of warfare and savagery is here too unknown, like some horribly racist line. Uh, but one of the accusations it's the king is he's not giving us Ohio, and in fact he's letting native people attack us. Um, when we're trying to take Ohio, because we're supposed to have Ohio. Um, and so it's this massive war that doesn't just happen on the East Coast, that doesn't just happen in New York and Boston and Virginia and South Carolina, but happens in Ohio. The American Revolution is here in Ohio, too. Um, in the 1780s, no, late 1770s, early 1780s, uh, George Rogers Clark of Virginia is sent out by the Continental Congress to take the, uh, the British forts of Fort Vincennes, Vincennes, Indiana, and Kaskaskia, a French town in Illinois. And he's going through Ohio and attacking tribes on his way through Ohio. Um, and in 1782, one of those infamous and now, frankly, least talked about moments of the revolution happens here in Ohio, the Gnadahoon Massacre. And you can see on this map, where's Gnadahoon? Right here. Again, not that far from us. You know, I've been massacred. If that name sounds kind of foreign to you, it's not because it's in a native language. It's German. We were talking about Germans before, weren't we? Moravians. This is a Moravian Delaware village. Um, this is a community of, of Lenape people who have fled the East Coast, settled in Ohio, converted to Moravianism, are being Christian. And what else are Moravians? Pacifists. Fully nonviolent, fully staying out of the war. Um, and in 1782, as, as kind of the American Revolution is coming to an end, and you have a few more troops, um, a, a militia of Pennsylvanians attack the Lenape village. They're mad because some other Lenape people participated, joined allied with the British in some of the parts of the war. And so they want to pay. They want the Lenape to pay for allying with the British. Well, they're not going to attack the Lenape that attack them. That's a fair fight. They might lose that. So they target a known pacifist Christian village. And I won't go into the details because it's, it's brutal. It's, it's heartbreaking. Um, it's out there. You can find it. Um, what, I will, what, the most, what I will tell you is uh, they basically they, they imprison people in camps because people aren't fighting back. They're pacifists. They drag them out, separate the men and women, drag them out one by one. Um, and in front of the Moravian missionaries, um, beat them to death. While they're doing so, the Moravians write in their journals that these, that these Lenape people are singing hymns to Jesus, begging for mercy, begging for, praying for the eternal life, the salvation of their soul, while the, the American troops during the American Revolution are beating them to death. It's 79 people, men, women, and children. There is, there is a memorial, a historic memorial that's there now. I recommend going. It's a powerful sight. You, you feel it, you know that? Um, but it's brutal. And it, in some ways sets the tone for what the American experience is going to be. Um, the French find ways of working together and living together in to Ohio. The British take some cajoling, but they, they, they'll accept some peaceful relations in trading with Ohio. For the most part, the Americans don't want to do that. And there's different theories and historiographies of why the Americans are, are do you differ from the British in this way. That's a whole other conversation. Um, but they want to... They've wanted it for decades. They want it back in the French Indian War. And so, revolution ends, 1783. By 1785, Congress has authorized the invasion of the Ohio Country. And this starts a series of wars we've kind of collectively to call the Northwest Indian Wars. 1785 to 1795. Um, it's a series of brutal wars across Ohio. Uh, again, Native people are starting to flee to Indiana, to other people. Both their, their women and children, and then go back to Ohio to fight. Um, it's 
there's, there's some moments where it looks like maybe people might actually win. Uh, in 1791, there's a, a, a battle called St. Clair's defeat. St. Clair was the head of the, the army at the time. Future governor of the Northwest Territory. Um, or actually, no, been ben governor at that point. Um, it's the largest casualty defeat of the United States military in history. It's like a 90% casualty rate. So there, there are moments. Um, but the Americans win. They get Ohio. And in 1791, the land we're standing on, or 1795, the land we're standing on gets ceded to the United States in the Treaty of Greenville. And so basically everything in kind of that orangey pink color is what's ceded in the treaty. The rest of this will be ceded in a couple, in the next 18 years, or 18, 20 years uh, over time, kind of piecemeal. But three, about three quarters of what's now Ohio, and including where we're standing today, is ceded in the Treaty of Greenville in 1795. It's a massive treaty. There's about 20 tribes there, because all these communities that have relationships with Ohio are coming. Even those who haven't been in Ohio for 30 years to the war pair are coming back and like, well, no, if we're selling this to the US, this is our homes too. These are where our ancestors are buried too. We also, you know. So it's this massive, massive treaty in uh, what's now Greenville, Ohio. And there's two articles I want to I want to point out to you because it sets the potential stage for what this could be. Article one. It's kind of standard. Henceforth all hostility shall cease, peace is hereby established, and will be uh, perpetual, and a friendly intercourse shall take place between the United States and the Indian tribes. War is out. It is a it's a land session treaty, but it's also a peace treaty. War is over. Article 6, I think, is actually really, really interesting. And I'll, I'll read parts of it here. I'll just read the whole way. Uh, if, if any citizen of the United States or any other white person or persons shall presume to settle on the lands now relinquished by the United States, such citizen and other person shall be out of the protection of the United States, and the Indian tribe on whose land the settlement shall be made may drive off the settler or punish him in such manner as they shall think fit. And because such settlements will be made without the consent of the United States, will be injurious to them as well as to the Indians, the United States will be at liberty to, shall be at liberty to break them up and remove them and punish the settlers as they think proper, and so affect that protection of the Indian lands hereby before stipulated. We, we often talk about these land sessions as a moment of American power. And they are. They're, that's a lot of land that shuts it. But I'd also like to highlight these where you can see Native peoples pushing back. You can see Native resistance. Because there's no way the, U, the federal government wanted that in the treaty. There's no way the federal government included a provision of like, oh yeah, if one of our citizens goes on your land, like, you can punish them. You can do what you like. We, even today, we get, if someone takes an American citizen hostage or prisoner in a foreign country, we get mad about it. And I think rightfully so. They're giving away kind of that provision to Native peoples. If an American comes in where they're not supposed to, you can punish them. They can be punished. That's a huge if enforced, a huge um, uh, give. It's a, a, a huge um, barter to give to give tribal nations. Again, whether or not it's actually honored, different conversation. Uh, but it ends with the answer no. It's not. But the fact that the U.S. the federal government's even willing to include that in a legal document that's still enforced to this day um, it says a lot about the power of tribes in these negotiating processes. But Americans are here. They have Ohio, they have Upper Arlington, they're ready to settle. But Native people are still living in Ohio, so what does that relationship look like? And I am watching the time. I'll do a couple points here. Again, they're different than the French and the British. Um, oh, by the way, so this is a map of, of Ohio at statehood, again, 1803. So again, when we think about what's now Ohio and what's not Ohio, we said one of the things, Ohio starts in 1803. Again, good chunk of this, Indian lands, not actually Ohio. Also, that's a whole other conversation. Connecticut claims land in Ohio for a long time. It's very weird. Um, that's why Case Western Reserve is called, it's called that, because it was the Connecticut Western Reserve. Um, but so, yeah, so like a large chunk of, again, Ohio, even at statehood, is not U.S. territory. But so you have to deal with some relationships. Well, one, right off the bat, they, kind of, they violate the first aspect of the treaty. It's not the beginning of peace. It's the beginning of land sessions. And so in 1803, 1805, 1809, and on and on and on, the U.S. comes back to tribes saying, no, we want more land. Um, and with all negotiations, always the threat of, and if you don't, well, you know, you might have an accident. There you go. There, 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 very much the mafia was so kind of language. It'd be, it would be a shame if someone came in and burned your bridge. <laughs> so I would sell us the land. And... So people were already pushed further and further out of Ohio into Indiana, into Michigan, some going to Canada. Um, sort of the push for assimilation. Uh, we often talk about native assimilation with the boarding school era of the late 1800s into the 20th century. And that's probably its biggest era, but it starts right from the beginning. 
Um, the Washington administration uh, uh, proposes and supports assimilation efforts through the Quakers. Um, and the Quakers are, again, I think an interesting choice. They're pacifists. They're nonviolent. They're not threats. All things I think people, many people will be a little more supportive of. Um, but one of the things that, that drives um, Americans crazy are indigenous gender systems. So you've got the quasi-matriarchal Iroquois, you've got the gender complementary um, Algonquian-speaking peoples, both of whom um, one of the tasks assigned to women is agriculture, farming. Women are farmers. Women control the land, they control the resources, they control the village. Uh, men's roles are more outside than the community. And, and again, particularly, women are farmers. And the Americans see this and just think, what a backwards, crazy system. Everyone knows men farm. This is, it was built in, into the foundation of humanity. Men farm and hunt, and women don't. And native peoples don't live that way. Women are farmers. Um, it actually affords women a lot of power in the community, because you literally control the food supply. Um, and so the Quakers very quickly go to New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana. There's this massive move of Quakers, um, particularly designed to create male farmers, to assimilate native peoples to, to American gender, gender labor roles. Um, and so right at the beginning, that, that's part of that relationship. And that's coming into uh, Wapakoneta, what's, you know, not too far from here in Ohio, into Fort Wayne, all those things. Um, and then, we kind of all know this, the illegal expansion onto native lands. So again, that little provision of if American comes in here, they're not supposed to, we'll take care of it. You know? They don't do that. Um, and in fact, that becomes uh, an impetus for further native land loss and removal. Um, the federal government then literally makes the argument, we can't control um, these white people coming into your lands. Wouldn't it be better if we moved you further away from them? And they'll describe it as, they're, they're the bad white people that are coming to do this to you, the bad white men. And so let's move you away from the bad white men so you want to deal with them ever again. Not stating that once they get that land, then, the, then they're going to immediately move to this new land. But that it becomes the, the, the language for removal, even though it is in direct violation of the treaty, which yeah, we, we're kind of aware of at this point. Um, I'm going to move a little fast now. Um, but one, more thing, one thing I do want to hit, um, basically all this ends up culminating in another war. Being a non-military historian, it's kind of weird to study Ohio because so much of Ohio is warfare. Um, but there's other things I, I find interesting too, but the War of 1812, again, global conflict centering in Ohio. Um, does anyone know who these two figures are? I do kind of uh, uh, give you a hint. <laughs> so, yeah, the man on the top is Tenskwatawa, also known as the Shawnee Prophet, and the one on the bottom, it's, this is a less famous picture of him, but the only one I can find that I think will oh, be big enough on this thing, is a young William Henry Harrison. Future president, governor of the Indiana Territory, but also his, lives kind of in, in Ohio and he goes back and forth. Again, borders are not firm. Um, and it kind of comes to head in these two figures. Tenskwatawa and his brother Tecumseh um, uh, argue for, a uh, for an end of land sessions. Um, and in fact, a, a removal of Americans from Ohio and American goods and supplies. And they call for an end of, um, end of Christianity in the region. They call for an end of... Um, American claws, metal tools, um, a rejection of all things American. Um, and, and of course, and particularly the removal of American people. Returning Ohio to how it was pre-contact is kind of the idea. Um, a rejection of everything that's kind of happened that we've talked about in this presentation with the French and the British and these trading relationships and, and, and kinship uh, relationships. They actually say any, any person of mixed uh, native European ancestry should go live with their European family, like a, a harsh end to anything that came with Europeans. Um, and you have William Henry Harrison, who's, by the way, people don't talk about this. He's like 25, maybe third. Like he is a He's my age. I was about to say a kid, but he's my age. He's my age. He's a governor of a state. That's, that's crazy. Um, but he's also uh, a general in, in the US military, tasked with quelling Tenskwatawa and his brother. Um, he's also an early proponent of Indian removal. Beginning in 1803, there's actually a letter between him and President Jefferson discussing how they're going to remove tribes from Ohio and, and Indiana. And it plays out exactly how they plan it. Um, and so this massive clash of warfare between these two communities. Um, they are kind of fu are fundamentally opposed to each other. Um, and we often talk about the extremes, and there are also people in the middle. There are native folks who don't want to go to war with the U.S. They don't see it as a viable option. They like having metal pots. You know, there's all, some of them are Christian. Like, there are a whole bunch of reasons why native people oppose it. And there are white people who also oppose ethnic cleansing in Indiana and Ohio. 
Um, but we always talk about the extremes because I think people find them more interesting. And they make the most noise. Um, and they're who we remember. And so it becomes this kind of last, last clash um, that really ends a lot of native power in Ohio and in, in the Great Lakes. It's just, for those who don't believe they can defeat the US in battle, this becomes the final moment. They can't. And so beginning in really the eight, late 18 teens, right after the war ends in 1815, um, at least on the native side, the, the European side's a little different, but uh, 1815, almost immediately after that, these tribes that are populating Ohio begin to leave. Some of them are through removal treaties with the US. Let me think of like Jacksonian Indian removal treaties. Um, it happened in the 1830s and 1840s, and some of them just leave. They just walk away. It's, it becomes very clear that they were able to live with the French. They figured out how to live with the English. It became very, very clear Ohio was not big enough for Native peoples and Americans. And so they leave. Um, so the, the Moravian Delaware actually go to Canada. They're still there today. Uh, there's still a Delaware tribe, Moravian tribe in Canada, in Ontario. Um, groups like the, some Shawnee in Ohio move to Mexico. Not just leave, the state. They, they go all the way down to Mexico and eventually move back up to Oklahoma. Uh, today, there's still, you saw on an early map, the Kickapoo tribe, who was also someone in Ohio. Today, it is still, there's a Kickapoo tribe in Mexico, um, just kind of getting out. Um, and then, of course, you have the four, other force removals that are at gunpoint, that are, again, these Jacksonian policies. Um, the last tribe removed from Ohio is 1843. It's the Wyandotte tribe. They're an Iroquois people from Ontario that move into Ohio uh, during, uh, at the end of the Beaver Wars, as people are coming back in the Morning Wars. Um, they're the last tribe, 1842. They last fairly long um, and end up, all these tribes that are in Ohio on this map end up either initially in Kansas, which is part of the inventory initially, um, and then after the Civil War, the U.S. wants Kansas, um, or directly to what is today Oklahoma. But that's not the end of the story. There was a moment there, some really awful moments where it was clear Native people and Ohioans couldn't live together. That was not an option. That would not be allowed to be an option by the people in power. But there are always those who, who, who fought that. There's actually a beautiful letter out of, I believe, Sandusky, Ohio, from this, uh, this, this church group, of uh, women's church group, uh, petitioning Congress not to pass the Indian Removal Act. They say, we can live with Native people. And they even say, like, some of these people are Christian, they are neighbors, they are friends. So there's always, even these dark moments, and they're dark moments, there's always these, these people that resist that, that push back against that. And we went through a long time where the extremists won. The people who would not allow any people in Ohio won. But that's changing. Beginning in the 21st century, maybe the 19th, I think the 21st century, tribal peoples are returning back to Ohio. Tribal nations are returning, returning back to Ohio. Native peoples have been going back to Ohio since the 1950s. Um, as, as people are leaving reservations, in the 50s and 60s, the federal government has a relocation program to try to take Native people off reservations to assimilate Native peoples and bring them into American society. Ironically, one of the places they choose is Cleveland to send, and I believe, I believe Cincinnati as well, um, but they choose Ohio to send Native peoples back to Ohio. Uh, so you have Native peoples returning to Ohio that way. In the 21st century, tribal nations are coming back to Ohio. Um, and uh, the, so this image, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, this is of Great Council State Park, just opened up this summer as a collaboration with the Eastern Shawnee Trinite, um, whose lands were kind of just north uh, west of here, uh, in, in 1832 were removed uh, through Indian removal to directly to Oklahoma, or they are today. But they've come back and they've partnered and had this great museum um, telling Shawnee history from a Shawnee perspective. Um, and coming back, into, and they, the, uh, people reply there are Shawnee citizens who live in Ohio, who are people's neighbors and friends and loved ones. Um, and so the story of Indigenous Ohio, I always have to do this jump from Indian removal to present, because the story of Indigenous Ohio doesn't end with Indian removal. It doesn't end with the people saying, we can't live together. It hasn't ended. And right now we've entered this really cool period where people are able to come together. Uh, I, as a Miami person, able to come here and tell our story. 100 years ago, that wouldn't have been an option for me. Um, 200 years ago, I would have shot on sight. But that's changed, and we're able to now come and talk to each other and, and come together. And I think that's beautiful, and I think that's the story of Indigenous Ohio. So, thank you. <laughs>